sounding so good. I'm gonna have to keep practicing. Fair enough. That's not such a good sound. You know, it's not a very brave sound. Inspiring kind of. Da da. Da da. I know. It's more like. <laughs> yeah, but you need the practice. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, what I mean is not you need the practice. I mean, a person needs the practice. You can't just... <laughs> well, it just happens to be me right now. In this case. <laughs> but what I'm saying is you can't just take up a musical instrument and be able to play it immediately. Uh, apparently not. <laughs> and while a, a tootling horn... Yeah. Uh, you know, some will say musical instrument, some will not. But in any case, it takes... There is an art to making it make the proper noise. And I am... Artless. No! <laughs> You are an artiste. I am very, very artless. Have you heard the sound of that? Say a proper hail and welcome to the lovely listeners. Hail and welcome. Hail and welcome. Hail. And, oh, sorry. Right. Hail and welcome. Is that all right? Is that? Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. It's good. Yeah. Hail and welcome. I wasn't sure whether it was like umphy enough. Umphy enough. Umphy enough. Is there a degree of umph that you need to go hail and welcome? I think so. You need to. You need Is to there? give it. You need to give it a sense of. Um, you need to mean it. Is what I'd say. Carry on. Thank you. Where were we? Hail and welcome. Hail and welcome. That's where we were. Hail and welcome to Frithcast number 16. Frithcast 16? 16. Well. How have you let us go on so long? I don't know. <laughs> There's got to be a law against it. <laughs> there probably is somewhere. They just haven't found us yet. <laughs> um, we're <welcome> fugitives. To... <laughs> fugitives from justice. Yep. In the middle of Derbyshire. Yep. <laughs> oh. It's all good. Okay, welcome to Frithcast episode 16. Hello. I'm Suzanne, I'm one of the ambassadors for TAC in the UK, to Kingdom, TAC being the Asatru community. Um, and uh, my, my, my name's Kate, and I'm a passing druid that Suzanne doesn't seem to have been able to shake off yet. <laughs> no, I guess not. I uh, keep, keep, quite like it if you stayed. Keep turning up and, and, and intruding on these otherwise yeah, very informative... Uh, little episodes. Yeah, they're all good. Ah. So today, mm. um, I thought we could scoot up round the virtual campfire. Yes. And have a bit of a natter about. Sh- shuffle up close, everyone. Shuffle up close, everyone. Shuffle, shuffle. We thought we'd have a bit of a natter today about the concept of sacred space. Yeah. So, looking at uh, a little bit about altars and altar space and the setups that you might have, mm-hmm. what you might have on an altar, or what, again, what you might have on an altar is very personal. Mm. It's very much with the UPG doing your thing. Okay. Because there isn't really a prescriptive rule book on how to heathen. No. And there isn't a chapter in said rule book that doesn't exist that says, this is how you set up an altar. Okay. Or sacred space. So I thought we'd have a bit of a natter about that concept of sacred space mm-hmm. and how I see it as a heathen okay. um, and how a bit of how you see it as well. Yeah. Today's episode comes from a suggestion from one of our lovely listeners mm-hmm. uh, who hopefully is listening to this. So we're going to have a natter around sacred space and okay. altars and um, what might go onto one, what you might choose to put on one, or where your sacred space might be, or if you're kind of new to all of this, Mm -hmm. some ideas that you can have a mull over and see how they fit for you. Okay. Most of this episode is going to be UPG. Big warning, klaxon, right there. Mm -hmm. Most of this is my personal understanding of how this works. Okay. As usual, the disclaimer is, it may not be everybody's personal understanding of how this works. And if you think, actually... That bit's 
kind of groovy, but I'm going to discard that bit. It's all good and groovy. Your kilometerage may vary. Your kilometerage may vary. Or mileage, or whichever. Mileage, it's if you prefer. It's all good and groovy. So your you can... parsecage might vary. Your parsec, yes. One of those mm. with lettuce. Very few people use parsecs, actually. 10% service tax. Indeed. Yeah. There are a couple of sagas that talk about um, the altars, but they tend to be the spaces inside what they used to call the communal halls, the community hall, uh, or the hof. Not to be confused with the hof. The hof! The hof. With the the Baywatch slow motion running thing going on. Not that kind of hof. I remember it. More importantly... More importantly, the car. The car. Because he had that cool car. He had a very cool car. But not to be confused with that, this is Hoff as in Hall. Okay. And it, it is a communal hall which the community or that little settlement would use and they would have their sacred things in that hall. Okay. Um, there are a couple of the sagas which mention those, those halls having altars inside them. Um, there is another kind of altar which is made of rocks or made of stone and is outside. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, it depends on your own personal circumstances as to what you find works for you. Okay. If you find an inside space works because you're living in a high-rise tower block, use an inside space. Mm. If you're living on a ranch with, I don't know, a couple of hundred square kilometres to your shiny good name, then an outside space will possibly work just fine as well. <laughs> or both. It's all good. Mm. But it's however you find this works for you. Mm. Um, generally, I find an altar is a space where I can put my special things, if that makes any sense. And it's quite a broad thing. Would you be willing to give some examples? Yes, I can look at my altar and on there I've got my drinking horn, mm-hmm. the Bicker's drinking horn. Indeed. Um, I've also got my set of runes okay. on there. I've got some small items of jewellery on there. I've got statues of, small statues of three of the gods on there. Mm-hmm. I've got a, uh, a figurine of a raven on there. Yep. And I have a hammer on there. You do. Some people may use a hammer as um, they've had it carved or they've fashioned it out of materials themselves. Mm-hmm. I've got a hammer from the DIY store <laughs> because for me it's practical. Yeah. And the only thing that that hammer gets used for is sacred ritual. It's not very big. Yeah. It's tiny, small. But for me, it represents that very practical aspect of defence. Mm. Um, and that connection to the sacred. Other people might find they've got other things on their altar. Okay. Some folks might want to decorate their space with a cloth, mm. an altar cloth. Some folks m- might prefer just to keep it bare. For some folks, I mean, I've got my altars made out of a, a box that I've got a cloth over and my things on top. Mm. Uh, a wooden, sort of wooden chest. A wooden chest. For some folks, it might be a shelf, or the corner of a desk, or the corner of a room, or a piece of cloth on the floor Mm. in the corner of a space. Mm. Whatever you find works for you is all good. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be precisely a wooden box of specific dimensions that you then put a cloth over. You You can use a shelf. It might be that if you've got little ones running around the house that you don't want your sacred items within reaching height. Mm. So you might want them on a shelf or you might want them in a special box that you can close and lock and put away. Yeah. But I find, for me, keeping my special things all in one place is a good thing. Mm. And that altar, for me, doesn't just give me a space where I can keep my things. That's the altar cloth, if you like, defines that sacred space. Yeah. The things that are on it are used for ritual and connection with the gods. Mm. They're not used for anything else. Okay. They are special items that are there and then. So, you, as I, as I know, you you have an altar space which is more for holding the important items. 
Yes. Um, it's not somewhere that you will normally sit or kneel or stand to perform ritual. No. But um, some people might. Some people and might. That's well, this all is good. Yeah. This is what I was sort of saying. I mean, this I was I was sort of going to say. Well, this is one use of what might be termed an altar. I mean, altars are generally used for holding ritual items and, yes. and sacred yeah. items and so forth. They might also serve as a shrine of sorts. Yes. Where you can, you know, you would you would actually perform your rituals and and, and so forth. Yes. I know in in. Um, a lot of uh, more, uh, how can I put it, um, witchy? Yes, yeah. Pagan uh, traditions uh, such as Wicca and so forth, um, you know, people will do, um, they will light the, their incense on there, they'll have their... Um, candles on there. Candles. Yeah. They'll have uh, symbols of the elements and so on. Yeah. Stored on there that they can that they can perform ritual with. And that's all good too. That's just as valid in in heathenism. Yes, yeah. It, nobody can tell you how to heathen. No. And if you find that the way that you connect with the gods is by looking at the change of seasons, the change of elements, you may decide that you want to dedicate your altar space to one particular member of the Aesir or Vanir. Mm-hmm. At any point through the year, you might think, actually... I'm going to create sacred space for this deity. Mm. And I'm going to create sacred space and then I'm going to sit and meditate or offer prayers of praise or offer incense in that space for them. Mm. And then once that ritual is done or once that time period is done, the altar changes either to um, one symbolic of all the gods and goddesses Mm -hmm. or it could be symbolic of a time of year you can change how your altar looks depending on what you're marking. Okay, so it's not... um... It's not absolutely prescriptive that it has to stay still. No. You you may find that as your practice develops, you want to change things that are on there. Mm. You can put candles on there. The simple act of sitting in a space or being in a space and lighting a candle with absolute focus on doing that can help your brain focus on the sacred relationships Mm. and leave the mundane and just go, right, this is is where my brain changes and I leave my mundane. With the lighting of a candle, I enter sacred space. Okay. I enter a space where I can communicate and I enter a space where I'm focusing on that member of the AC or Vanir. Which leads us fairly smoothly, I thought, into the question of what is sacred space? Now, this probably sounds very basic. Yes, um, it can be. It can be deceptively complicated all at the but, same time. <laughs> but I'm, I'm conscious that we have rather different ways of looking at things. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can sometimes find that things, you know, we can use the same term... Yes. And then discover that we mean completely different things by it. Yes. So when a heathen says sacred space... Yes. What is she talking about? What is he talking about? When I say the term sacred space, what I am defining is a physical area, Mm -hmm. whether it's temporary or permanent, where I can symbolically put myself near or in or around and focus on the relationship I have with the gods. Mm. So the reason that that is hugely vague is because my altar is sacred space. Yeah. But I can go to a stone circle and that is sacred space. Mm -hmm. I can go and sit on a huge big boulder by a river and that becomes sacred space Okay. for me to be in. Mm. It's a place where I can feel that connection, to choose to feel that connection more strongly. Mm. And to make a, a mental choice to focus on that relationship that I have with the gods mm. rather than wondering what I'm having for tea and whether I need new shoes and what I'm doing on X, Y and Z. It's a time and space I can put that aside. So sacred space for me, my altar is a permanent one okay. in the house. You know it, you've seen it. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. 
for some people they may not have the luxury of having a permanent altar. Mm. An altar may be a a tin that you've got a candle and a statue and a prayer in. Mm. It may be a set of god posts outside mm. that are sort of two meters tall in a half circle with a huge big stone altar in the middle of it. Wow. Oh yeah. But wow, but sacred space. So sacred space for me, every person has their own different idea of what sacred space is. Mm. For me as a heathen, they can be places where I can feel that connection more strongly. Okay. Or like my altar space, where I can create that connection, mm. which some people may or may not choose to do. Mm. Sacred space, if I'm going into ritual... When I stand shoulder to shoulder with people in ritual, if I'm there with a group, mm. and I start with the Hammerite, that is creating sacred space. It's creating a point where you come from the mundane into the, the sacred, mm. into focusing on that relationship and into putting meaning and thought behind your words yeah. and concentrating on what that is. Uh, an offering dedication or offering prayer or offering words Mm. when the ritual is over and you've made your offerings and given your thanks or offered uh, prayers of praise then you close that sacred space okay and it becomes earth Mm. and trees and sky it's not to say it's less sacred but it's to say that your intent the focus that you put into creating it for that moment becomes a shared sacred connection between you and the people that have stood with you. Mm. Once the rite is over, you still have that shared experience, that shared connection, but you signal the end of the rite and you signal that you are coming from the sacred back into the mundane. Okay. Yeah. I brought the big words out. I hope you don't mind. <clears throat> no, it's not. It's absolutely good. It's, I mean, it, it is probably fair to say that it is a a concept parallels of which can be found in probably most traditions all the things um, yes certainly i mean we mentioned sort of wicca and similar yes uh, yeah. religions of, of, of that category um certainly my own uh, i can relate a, a, a sort of similar concept mm. um and i would even venture to say that similar things occur in a lot of the more sort of mainstream religions of the world yeah um certainly in christianity where you know it's uh, that's the whole point of a of a church and especially the the bits up at the top where the um they create the, sacred space yeah. yeah um i know um you know in islam there's uh, a lot of uh, ritual around Washing, washing yourself before prayer and all yes. that kind of thing. Which you is, take your shoes off. You take your shoes off. Because again, you are entering sacred space and mm. that act of taking your shoes off and putting them on the rack yeah. signals to your brain when you repeat that act over and over and over again, it deepens that reinforcement mm. of this is sacred space. This is where you come and you say your devotions and when you are done you can go back and you can pick your shoes up and that's the signal for you coming out and coming back into the mundane similar um similar concepts would have existed in uh, ancient rome yes um I, with shrines the, temples shrines and temples and these particular kinds of clothing uh romans would often wear um hoods or head coverings as yes. part of their preparation for entering that space. Uh, they might wear masks. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. They might take their clothes off. No, too cold. Depending on. Ah, <laughs> uh, but we're talking about Rome, so. Yeah, yeah good point. It's a few degrees warmer in Rome. <laughs> if you don't have space for a permanent altar, it's not a problem. Okay. If you don't have permanent sacred space outside that you go to that's not a problem either you can go to um, a public park and or you could go to a nearby forest or wood and find sacred space there just the same Mm. some pagans that i know of may choose to do without ritual tools or ritual specialist equipment Mm. like um like a drinking horn like a blowing horn like statues of the gods 
they may choose to use whatever nature brings them. Yeah. At the same time, and that's just fine. Whether you make your own hammer mm. or you buy it from a blacksmith's or a DIY store, it will serve just as well. But it's what you want out mm. of it. You oh. don't have to go out and get all the shiny posh kit. For me, mm. the very practical one I've got works just the same. Granted, it's a little bit heavy if I drop it on my toes, <laughs> but I'm trying not to do that too often right now. So you can make your hammer? Yes. You can buy your hammer? Yes. Or you could inherit your hammer from your great-great-grandfather who's passed it down over the, over the generations and occasionally it's needed a new handle and occasionally it's needed a new head, but it's still the same hammer. Yes. Okay. It works just the same. Cool. And it's what works for you individually. It's how you connect. Mm. So altars are as deeply personal as anything can be. Yeah. And if you think, well, you know, altars aren't really for me, that's okay. Mm. It's just fine. One of the things you might consider when you go before the gods in sacred space, in ritual, in... Uh, prayer and thanksgiving is to treat yourself as the altar so dress take as much preparation in dressing yourself in making yourself presentable for the gods mm. and treat yourself as the sacred space that can be a quite an interesting thing to if you have particular <clears throat> ritual clothes yes, or whatever that you yeah. you tend to wear or for, uh, items of jewelry or Yes, but Never putting matter. those on with intent and making a ritual out of that preparation can help you enter that mindset of sacred space. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a physical space. You could enter that mindset of sacred space, you know, listening to... You could pre-record prayer. Mm. Put it on your mobile phone, listen to it in your headphones. Yeah. Go to work on the train, walking to work, whatever it is, put it on mm. and listen to it over and over again and it will create that sense of sacred space, that deepening of connection, which is, for me, one of the things I'm aiming for is to deepen that, widen and deepen that understanding of the gods. Mm. Mm. And sacred space and altars is one of the ways I can do that. Yeah. But it's, again, it's proportionate to what you have and your own personal circumstances. Mm. So I didn't go out and buy all my ritual kit all in one day because I needed to get used to each piece of it and to build it up over quite a long while. Yeah. To things that felt right for me mm. at that time and place. There weren't sort of things that I rushed out and bought everything all in one go. No. It wasn't that kind of an exercise it was very much a let's see what connects and let's do this with intent mm. and find connections with things so you don't with an altar space you could you know as i said before you could dress it for one of the gods mm. you could dress it for sunna you could use particular colors particular items to help represent that so for an altar to sunna the sun mm. especially at midsummers, you could look at a an altar cloth in reds or in yellows or in oranges or a combination of all of those, yep. or even a white altar cloth with you know red and yellow and orange embroidery on it that you've sewn yourself, mm. or something else that you've spent time and effort making yeah. or creating. If you're looking at sunna, it might be that you have an image of the sun, um, either. A printed out picture or a portrait there might be a yellow candle or a red candle mm. there might be sunflowers you might you can bring fresh flowers onto your altar or fresh fruit if you've got citrus fruits for mm. summer mm. if your way connects you with crystals you might be looking at things like sunstone amber yeah citrine topaz topaz so you could look at bringing themes of color into your altars mm. You could look at doing an altar for every season, mm. every major festival having a change of altar. What if? <clears throat> I mean, obviously we've 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 looked at the personal interpretation of what an altar can be 
like. What about those of your community who are who are particularly interested in attempting to connect with the the old way as they would have been practiced, or as much as possible as they would have been practiced back in the sort you know the peak century. of the peak of the Norse mm. Norse period. I mean, what do they have any any sort of sources that they can look at? Or there do... are a couple that I know of mm-hmm. that talk more about the building and the items in it than actually the rituals that happened. Okay. There is a chap called Adam of Bremen, and we'll put the links in the description like we usually do, but he talks about a great temple centre at a place called Uppsala in Sweden, Mm. and he talks about a great building that has chains around the roof where they do a lot of sacrifices, including people. Yep. Do not try this at home. Definitely not, no. No. That makes it slightly more tricky because you don't know why they're doing it, what they're doing it for, whether Mm. he's seen it with his own eyes or whether he's just hearing it from people. There are a couple of descriptions of altars, but they are community altars rather than personal ones. Okay. And the community altars from the sagas, as far as I remember, are an altar space inside one of these hofs, one of these buildings. They have idols or statues of the gods there either with the altar space in front of them Mm. and there's generally two things that are mentioned on that altar space one is a bowl and the other is an oath ring okay and the oath ring was for the community members to to grab hold of in ceremony or in ritual and make an oath on okay hence an oath ring Mm -hmm. and the gothi the priest would then wear that community's oath ring to the the thing, the the meeting, the community meetings, and he would open up proceedings, but he would have that oath ring on his wrist right. while he was doing that. And when he wasn't wearing it, it would go back on the altar. Okay. In the in the hof in the community hall. Okay. Now the other item I mentioned was a bowl. Mm-hmm. And this is a bowl for again for sacrificial blood. Mm. When they were killing an animal in sacrifice, they would catch the blood in a bowl. Okay. And use that blood in a bowl to flick it over the participants and offer it to the gods. How very Roman. How very Roman. Pass us that big knife shall you tar and that big ball, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So things have changed a little bit. The sacrifice of an animal in in Viking society in tenth century medieval Scandinavian society is quite a big thing. Mm. There Wealth is intrinsically based on herds and success in farming and cattle. Raiding does bring in a source of wealth, but it's not a guaranteed one. Mm. Neither is farming, come to think of it in that era. (laughs) But if they offered a cow in sacrifice, or they offered an animal in sacrifice, that was a big thing for them. Yeah, It's not as big for us now. No. Our wealth in our societies now is based on money and bank accounts and cars and internet access and mobile phones. And data. And data. Mm. So if we were to sacrifice a cow, it wouldn't have the same cultural understandings. And for me, it's been a thousand years the gods have changed. Mm. They've stayed the same, but they've changed. Well, they have... There is inevitably a link between a society and and that society's deities. Yes. You know, whichever way you believe that link Cultural goes. Cultural concepts uh, are yeah. what help shape your understanding of where the gods come from mm. and what they do. It's, uh, I mean, I would, I would, again, I would say the same about, about Rome. Back then, sacrifice of animals was central mm. to a lot of their religious traditions. So you would end up with, you know, I want a particular thing, therefore I'm going to buy a cow or a chicken or whatever, and I'm going to kill it and I'm going to dedicate it to this particular god. Whereas yes. nowadays that simply wouldn't make sense as sacrifice because I haven't had to raise that cow, unless I'm a farmer, obviously. Yes. You know, but I haven't had to raise it. I could, I could probably buy a cow. I have no idea. How would you go about buying a cow? Cattle market. Cattle market, yeah. yeah. Cattle but auction. I could go and buy a cow and kill a cow. I'm not going to do this, by the way. I could go and buy a cow, kill a cow, and it would be meaningless. Ex- Obviously, it would mean a lot to the cow. Yeah. But in yeah. terms of in terms of Cultural my value. my sacrifice, it wouldn't mean anything because I'm not invested in that cow. I've just bought it. That's all. 
Yes. I might as well just throw the money down a well. Yeah, or give the money to the guards. Or give the money to the guards. Well, yes, that, that was kind of what I meant. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's... Uh, although I think probably there needs to be another episode on the nature of sacrifice. I think there might have to be. But for altars and sacred space, it's all very personal. Mm. There are a couple of accounts of what altars look like. There are a couple of accounts of what the rituals look like. Mm. There isn't an awful lot. No. So it's rediscovering that connection, re-understanding what that connection means to you as an individual. Mm. How do you connect to the divine? And what kind of personal experiences you have with that mm. are going to be different to everybody else's. And that's yeah. okay. Mm. It's... Even when you're starting out, if you have an experience with the divine, they can tell you that that's a wrong experience to have. No, no. Nobody can... You know, if you've if you've been on the path a year, and you have an experience with the divine, or five years, or ten years, or twenty years, you have an experience with the divine. Mm, mm. This is your own personal understanding of sacred space, and your own personal understanding of deity mm. and the gods. Yeah, and they will connect with everybody in the ways that they want to. Yeah. And I can't go to another heathen and go, your experience is invalid. Because I know for a fact that Thor wouldn't do that. Because mm. that's not going to work. And Thor goes like, who are you to tell Excuse me what me? I will do and what I won't yes. do? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So for me, there is nobody who can tell me how, the he how to heathen. No. And I cannot tell anybody else how to heathen. No. But I can talk you through... How I heathen. Yeah. And say... See if any of it resonates. If it resonates with you, take it, use it, it's all good. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. Yeah. You know, it's it's all very much a UPG episode this time around, I think. Well, there's a lot of it about. There is, and it's all good. And it's all good. Uh, as long as it's all done in good faith. Yes. Well, yes, in more ways than one. Yes. So we'll leave it there for today. Okay. We'll put some links in the descriptions, like we usually do. Yep. If you want to find us online, mm -hmm. I'm Suzanne Martin. I am one of the ambassadors for TAC for the United Kingdom. Yeah. You can find me on Facebook under Suzanne Martin. Yeah. Or on Twitter at Suzanne TAC, T -A -C. And uh, if you w want to find me for any reason, I can be found at glassrain.net. Glass as in window, rain as in the stuff that runs down the window. And uh, all my profiles are linked from there. So we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, so... Cover your ankles, woman. You're being a scandalous. I am. <gasps> it's... Hang on, what day is it? Wednesday. That's all right, it's my scandal day. Oh, um, that's all right then. Ignore that. Carry on. Good. I wouldn't think I, I wouldn't like to think I was doing unscheduled scandaling. <laughs> you just can't you schedule your scandaling. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Otherwise, things can get very complicated. How come I'm your wife and I didn't know that? <laughs> well, I don't I know. I didn't know there was a whole day for scandal. You work Wednesdays. Oh. <laughs> it's only normally like you know an hour in the morning a couple of hours in the afternoon that's and I'm missing all of that yeah, well no. I tell you what I can always reschedule that's like 12 hours a month that's 144 hours a year and we've been married five years how much scandal have I missed 144 hours yeah so I owe you 144 hours of scandal I think I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> I'm not sure our listeners will. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Shall we move on? Yeah. Um. Anyway, before we got on talking about my ankles, um, <laughs> um my nice ankles. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, listeners. I've lost it. Give me a minute. I'll be fine. We might have to cut this all out. Uh, yeah, we might.